Hello, I'm Casey Aiken, and this is 21 This Week. Coming up next, a lot to unpack from a very active session of the General Assembly. Will new members on the County Council scuttle the proposed budget? And Muslim community objects to MCPS rescinding opt-out policy for parents regarding LGBTQ books. Our panel of insiders will give you the story behind the story. We are joined by former County Council member and president of Rebuilding Together Montgomery County, Nancy Florine, and Secretary of the Maryland Republican Central Committee, Mark Uncafer. Stay tuned for these stories and more on the next 21 This Week. There was an amazing amount of legislation passed by the General Assembly this year during Governor Moore's first term in office. The list of important legislation is long and it's exhausting. Everything from abortion, gun control, recreational marijuana, horse racing, police reforms, gender affirming care, and increases in the minimum wage. And that's just a small sample of the major pieces of legislation that was passed this year. Legendary South African leader Desmond Tutu wisely stated that there was only one way to eat an elephant, one bite at a time. And that's precisely what we're going to do today in our preview of the General Assembly as we address this historic session of the Maryland General Assembly. Nancy, in response to the Supreme Court's decision in the Buren case, Bruin case, excuse me, that struck down overly restrictive New York gun control legislation, which was very similar to the laws here in Maryland, the General Assembly addressed the matter, passing a series of that, among other things, restricts the ability of gun owners from uh, sensitive places. And is this an o- overreach by the legislature on the rights of gun owners? Well, my view of uh, the General Assembly is have they done so- anything that reflects, uh, ha- that hurts Montgomery County? Or have they done something that reflects the views of uh, Montgomery County voters more or less? And I think uh, that's certainly what they've done with gun legislation. Uh, and I'm sure, you know, they're because of the litigation that's happened elsewhere, uh, they've talked to a lot of lawyers about what they feel that they can employ to achieve um, uh, more gun control uh, presence, such as it is, uh, to the extent that they can exercise it under the Constitution and the, all the arguments that have been had over the years. So, yeah, I think they've done the best they can. Mark, what's, what's your, what's your well, view? Since this is more with... performance than actual uh, legislating. Uh, I think that uh, it, whatever advice, whichever lawyers they were speaking to, um, the, the wise counsel would have been that this would probably not withstand a, a legal challenge. Uh, I don't think they really cared because I think they made the, the political point that they wanted to make. I, I will say that I'm very disappointed that a perennial issue was not addressed, which is making the theft of a firearm a felony, um, which is something that uh, the majority has resisted. And would I think help uh, crime and violence in Baltimore in particular uh, to a great degree, that wasn't done. Well, I mean, I I also think that, you know, when it comes to gun control, there's a great great deal of people that are uh, in in areas which are not so well protected by police and in poor areas of of our of our cities and of of our of our our state that rely on guns for self-protection. And I think this, the attack on, on uh, concealed carry uh, is, a, is a bad decision by the, by the General Assembly. But as, as I think you, you noted, Mark, there'll probably be a court challenge and uh, we'll, see, we'll see where it, it leads to. And I, now sticking with you, Mark, lawmakers also approved a constitutional amendment uh, or at least a proposed constitutional amendment to enshrine the right of abortion in Maryland, in the in the Maryland Constitution. You know, this is this is kind of an odd piece of legislation since the Constitution, the Maryland Constitution, already uh, preserves the right to an abortion. So, what's going on with this piece of legislation? 
Well, uh, not to be, uh, you know, strike the same note again, but again, this is more performance than uh, actual legislating since that has been uh, the law for uh, in Maryland for quite some time. It does reflect that uh, late term abortion. Indeed, Maryland had less restrictive uh, law, laws uh, than even states uh, such as New York until very recently. New York uh, they changed it. Um, so this won't change things in Maryland, but it does in fact make a political statement, which is precisely what uh, they wanted to do as well uh, on, the, on the gun issue. Well, Nancy, I mean, the abortion issue is, has become very, very hot. We saw this in the Wisconsin election for the Supreme Court, where uh, that became a very big topic. I mean, we're going to have to have a plebiscite on this uh, in the next election cycle. Uh, how big an issue is this? Well, I... I don't think this is going to be a problem in passing, whether it's truly necessary, as Mark suggests, is, is probably the right question. But nonetheless, I mean, Marylanders want to cement their, their uh, position on this point. And so I, I don't think it hurts anything. And it certainly makes it clear to the rest of the country, uh, Maryland is a reliable place when you have that issue in front of you. So, you know, I don't think it's a problem. And I, I think it's something that voters will feel comfortable in weighing in on. And it's, again, it's something that brings a lot of voters probably to the polls. Uh, and that's important for the Dems. Well, here's, here's where I disagree with you slightly. I, because it's already in the Constitution, I think this is going to be a hard fought battle. I think they're going to be the pro-life community is going to fight th this, this proposal very hard since it opens the door for late-term abortion. And uh, I, so I, I don't think this is gonna be an easy victory uh, for-, uh, for but, but Casey, late-term abortion late is already permitted under existing Maryland law. And in A and B, if you make the case that is already in the constitution, then whether the, legis the amendment passes or not doesn't really change what the constitution says. Well, so uh, again, this is more performance than actual legislating. Well, you know, I, I think it's going to be a hard, hard, hard fought battle myself. So we'll, we'll have to wait and see. Nancy, I, I want to stick with you. Um, uh, Governor Moore reversed the Hogan administration regarding the linkage between Maryland and California when it comes to uh, the environment and uh, particularly on automobile emissions. Mm -hmm. uh, the legislature just passed something called the Clean uh, Truck Act or Air Air Control Act, something like that. It has Advanced Clean Trucks Act, excuse me. And we want to get to zero duty emissions by 2027. I mean, this seems like, you know, a dream, you know, a dream list type of bill. How do you do uh, that? You know, uh, it's interesting. Uh, certainly California has led the way on these issues and to the point where legislation nationally recognizes that. So, uh, I mean, that's trying to, I think this is uh, uh, an effort to get, uh, establish a Maryland presence nationally, which, you know, we're a tiny little state compared to a lot of places. So it's, I think it's a, a clearly a political move. Can we achieve this? And we're not gonna control the automakers. They're not gonna talk to us. Uh, so uh, again, it's really, uh, like, well, it'll be kind of fun to see how this goes. Uh, you know, you know, Mark. Um, there's there's been a lot in the in the news about electric vehicles, but they're all automobiles. This is calling for heavy duty trucks to become electric. There's the only the only there are only a few relative examples out there. This is this is pie in the sky stuff. This is just you know throw the mud on the wall and see if it sticks. This is an exercise in, in central planning and in that central planning, mandating the use of technologies that really currently don't, don't currently exist um, and certainly also raise significant environmental challenges when you get into the materials that go into battery and the availability of battery technology. Um, this, I think, is going to be one of the fault line issues of the coming decade of the uh, costs and consequences of these mandated choices, uh, which are really not affordable, 
uh, and where the existing infrastructure, the electric infrastructure, the grid in order to, to uh, su support these, uh, these mandates don't exist yet and may not be in existence in time. So um, if I could just comment on that one, sure. uh, Casey, uh, it raises the question is more already uh, running for president. <laughs> well, I don't. I, I think that was that was answered before the election, <laughs> with the with the publication of his second autobiography. <laughs> but that's a great question. We only have time for one more one more topic, and I want to talk about the, the with with you, Nancy, about the marijuana recreational use uh, act that was that was passed, and it comes in, goes into effect on July first. You know, I don't understand how progressives who hate tobacco smoke and who hate people vaping can just blithely say, well, smoking marijuana is okay. Uh, well, Casey, I have to say the uh, people spoke on this issue. Yeah. So okay. they're really just implementing what was voted on uh, in the last election. Well, but in, <laughs> you know, the corollary to this is that the legislature uh, did pass, and Mark, this is for you, you know, uh, a bill that says that the mere odor of can burnt cannabis isn't, doesn't give probable cause for a stop. My, my goodness, we're going to have traffic accidents all over the place because of the increased use of marijuana, aren't we? So what I was thinking about that is if, if a car is in a crash and the police come on the crash and they smell marijuana in the crash, shouldn't they be able to search the car? I mean, the answer is they're not allowed, wouldn't be allowed to search the car to determine whether or not there was marijuana presence in order to make a determination as to whether the driver might have been uh, uh, under driving under the influence. But where's the mothers against drunk driving for something like this? I mean, this is, I think this is just a terrible, terribly, you know, uh, lax bill. It was a feel-good bill, unfortunately. When we come back from this short break, the Muslim community objects to MCPS rescinding the opt-out policy for parents regarding mandatory LGBTQ books. Stay tuned. Welcome back. A significant conflict may be brewing between Montgomery County Public School System and, and Muslim parents uh, over the planned MCPS rescinding of an opt-out policy, which would have allowed parents to opt out of a required LGBTQ reading requirement for elementary schools. You know, Mark, MCPS policy stated that students and families may not choose to opt out of engaging with any instructional materials other than family life and human, human sexuality units of instruction. What's, what is more human sexuality than transgenderism and LGBTQ issues? Why is, the, why is the MCPS taking this stance? Well, this I think is a reminder of the sort of dueling definitions or conflicting definitions of diversity. So there's the diversity that focuses on identity and then there's the diversity of, that is inclusive of the notion of people who have different ideas and have different diversity of thought. Uh, and the fact the Muslim community raises this issue kind of also underscores the fact that people of faith may not always agree uh, with what MCPS is, you know, communicating and when and when, when and where and how should those parents have the opportunity to be able to opt out. Um, and the fact it's interesting is Muslims, it could have just as easily have been sort of more fundamentalist Christians, but they frankly don't have much standing with MCPS. Uh, so we'll see what happens with this. Well, certainly, Nancy, the, the, the involvement of the Council of American Islamic Relations, CARE, and their opposition to this has brought the, brought the subject to the, the national media even. So, I mean, again, it seems it seems odd. Montgomery County changed their policy last December on this issue, and and the really I don't quite understand why they did. Well, you know, I have to say, I think Mark uh, captured the issue. Uh, diversity is really is not sex education, 
or sexuality per se as uh, dis defined in the state regulations, and that's what they say they're adhering to. So, I mean, it, it, it's maybe it's a tough pill for uh, certain communities of interest to accept. Uh, but the fact is, people of different uh, gender identities uh, are part of our population, and that's part of their their um, their educational process in terms of ex exposing kids to this reality. Um, but it's not sexual sex ed, which is something you can opt out of. Which, for, from my perspective, I think is terrible. So, well, actually, but, but actually, some of the, you, some of the I mean, books that, about that. Um, some of the required reading to be books does to go this. into graphic images of sexuality, and I think this is as it's not a you know it's not a question of whether or not we recognize that there are children of, that that, right. uh, that of divert of a diverse nature, that there may be there 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 tr gay children, transgender children. That's really not you know that that acceptance can be taught in a certain in a, in a in a way that doesn't deal with sexuality and i think that's where the parents are coming coming from that's where i would certainly be opposed am opposed to it if you're having books that show graphic images i wouldn't want that shown to my three-year-old my five-year-old my 10-year-old in any regard in a public school setting so that's where the question is you know, is are is the are the books that are being chosen by MCPS appropriate? And do parents have a right to opt out if they're not? And you know, I haven't read them. Have you? Uh, I, well, I've, seen, listen, I've seen them. Yeah, I'm no, not but, really. Has any but, of us looked at these volumes? But the issue, though, is the no. Role of, the answer is no. So the let's is yes. let's let's I order them, them, and then we can talk about it. Mark, go ahead and finish. This I was going to say, but there is an issue here of of the the relative position of the school system and parents, and who should be sort of paramount in in the decision making process. Um, and you know, it's interesting to go in and discuss you know, what's in the in the uh, in the curriculum, but that's the fundamental question: is is should parents have a veto over? some of the content of what is taught at MCPS. And the school system's position is very clear, no, unless we are absolutely forced by law to do so. Well, it's, it's, it's an interesting, it's, it's a topic. We, and we've been talking about this for two years since this arose in, in the Virginia elections uh, two years ago, uh, whether or not there should be a parental bill of rights uh, in, in Maryland. And, and that's one thing we haven't, we haven't gotten to yet. We need to go on to our final topic. You know, nothing like easy topics today, but there's nothing like a proposed tax increase to get the attention of county council members. In the first review of County Executive Mark Elrich's proposed budget, which includes a whopping 10% increase in property taxes, among other extravagances, first uh, term council member Dawn Lutke and Marilyn Balcom question the size of the large funding increases for the county agency and the use of one-time revenue for ongoing spending. Nancy, you're the insider of all insiders. What the heck is going on here? Well, there's a rule in politics, uh, at least in Montgomery County, if they're gonna do anything hard, do it your first year. And so that's what this council's looking at, um, some big financial issues. I don't know uh, what they're going to do. Um, frankly, they have already very large reserves, Montgomery County does. So I query whether we have too much money on hand. Uh, Mark is proposing moving some of that around for one-time expenses. That violates the, the set of principles that uh, the council has adopted over the years in terms of how you manage the money. Are they going to go along with the raises that are proposed? They're six to nine uh, percent uh, in different categories of employees. That's a lot of money. There's a big raises. Are they worrying about the future? I mean, query uh, whether real estate tax revenue is going to continue at the rate that it is as uh, real estate leases expire. And you know more than anybody, Casey, uh, what that means for uh, tax income for Montgomery County. Uh, those are all um, 
uh, part of the equation that they're going to have to take up. They're not going to decide until the end of May. Uh, but, you know, we'll see. I mean, I, I suspect there's a liberal, t liberal group. Uh, will they go along with this? I don't know. All right, that's, those are big increases uh, to look at this year. Well, but it also locks in increases in the future. I mean, this is the, you know. Well, that's the thing. This, you this, know, is, uh, this is a problem yeah. when we're facing budget deficits, alleged budget yeah. deficits every, every year. And absolutely. And you, men uh, you mentioned, and you mentioned the the issue rega regarding um, uh, economic growth. The, the commercial real estate market here in Montgomery County is in shambles. The, the occupancy rate is higher than it has ever been for office and for retail. The only in, the only uh, sector that's doing well is industrial, and there's not enough of it, not enough industrial zoned, and we've got we're going to have a big issue, big problem supporting this because the revenue from uh, taxes will not be there in the future. I I'm very worried about about that. Remember, side remember that uh, personal pro. Oh. Our real estate property taxes cannot increase uh, by more than 10% a year, at least for existing homeowners. Uh, so there is a constraint on how much revenue this could bring in anyways, uh, be, based on assessments and all that. So, uh, you know, it's it, there's a lot of moving pieces here, uh, but I'm not sure. Um, I haven't seen anything on the, on the long-term question of where they see revenue going. Uh, Montgomery County is made out like a bandit, frankly, over the years. Uh, and again, uh, there have not been, and I've told you this m many times, uh, there have never been uh, many community protests about taxes. You may talk about it amongst yourselves, but we don't hear, elected people uh, do not routinely hear that, certainly not at budget hearings. Uh, they hear at budget hearings, um, uh, spend more preserve my 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 uh, favorite school, preserve my favorite uh, uh, nonprofit, preserve my favorite function, preserve my revenue, uh, preserve well, my income. But although not, I would don't spend money. Yeah, Mark, no, there, there is a, yeah, I was going to say there there is a substantial spend more constituency and it was driven in, at least at the county council meetings or hearings by public employee unions that are pushing very hard for the raises that uh, Nancy referenced. Uh, but I, to, to Casey's point, I would also point out that after years of growth, uh, Montgomery County's population is now declining. Uh, and that may well be the ability to, you know, not work, to work from home and to work somewhere else, to work somewhere that is much more affordable than Montgomery County. So we'll, we'll see. I think we, we do have some long-term serious economic challenges in this county. I uh, think you well said, and we're, and we're going to have to wrap it up there. Stay tuned now for Parting Shots. Welcome back. Now with Parting Shots, Nancy Florine. Uh, uh, spring is upon us, finally. It seems to be warming up, and that means everyone's out in their yard. And uh, if you have one and digging around and uh, looking at your gardens, and the one thing I'd say, please try to avoid pesticides um, in your gardens as you uh, look at your lawn care program. If you look at um, anything uh, in the yard, please try to avoid putting chemicals out there. They go right into the Potomac when it rains, and that's a bad thing for all of us. Thank you, Nancy. Mark Unka for your parting shot. Well, I'm going to stay on the same theme as, as Nancy, but I'm going to focus on, on the cherry blossoms. Uh, one of the absolute glories of our region uh, are our uh, flowering trees that come in spring. As somebody who moved from uh, upstate New York, where we had winter and then slush and then summer, uh, coming to Washington and, and seeing our magnificent uh, trees is, is really a, a joy. It's also a reminder of really the benefits of sort of long-term planning and thinking. Uh, those trees were planted over a century ago, many of them. Uh, and it's really been a, something that we as uh, Washingtonians have been able to benefit from for a very long period of time. Well, thank you, Mark. Uh, by the time uh, this this um, show is aired, the month long cherry blossom festival will have uh, ended uh, with a rousing parade down Constitution Avenue on uh, Saturday the fifteenth. 
just in time to pay your, your income taxes, right? So I hope uh, I want to thank you both. These were tough topics. I appreciate your willingness to delve in and they're important topics to talk about. They impact uh, Montgomery County in a great deal, in a great way, as, as well as the state of Maryland. For 21 This Week, I'm Casey Aiken.